I was 10, 11, 12, I don't remember, in line for the movies. And my, there were two guys in line in front of us, like three or four people in front of us holding hands. And my mother pulled me to her, not my siblings, just me, and looked at my father and said, they're weird. Which just made me look at those guys and I went, oh, now I get it. I'm weird like they're weird. And, and I looked at them and I thought, they look happy, they look like they're in love. Um, I'll be fine. Inform brings you incredible stories. I left two days before the revolution. It killed me so hard. James has never experienced the taste of fruits that haven't been attacked by pesticides, just like he's never experienced a neighborhood that hasn't been attacked by bullets. Some things just go hand in hand. People say what's on their mind. I think that it is a, um, a cardinal sin to lie to the American people um, about war. Partisanship is a version of narcissism. In downtown San Francisco, the Commonwealth Clubs and Forum curates events that bring you face to face with the world's changemakers. One third of the wage gains that women have made since the 1960s were made as a result of the birth control pill. Twitter is a technology that I don't think we've seen before in this world. Since 1903, the most innovative leaders have come to the Commonwealth Club to share their vision. Sharing cars, sharing their homes, sharing, sharing a shared dream, a shareable American dream. That could work. You each can play a role in helping us chart a better future. Housing and health and education and policy all live close to the surface in us when our children are murdered. It's all the same story. We bring together the visionaries shaping the emerging trends in technology. It was a combination of instant and telegram. It was the idea that you could take a moment in time and you could capture it and you could just send it out and broadcast it with the entire world. I just threw the site together in about a week when I was at school. Oh, great. We've got angels, we've got incubators, we've got accelerators, we've got seed funds, we've got crowdfunding. We eat, we drink. <laughs> One of our first dates ever, we pickled like 100 pounds of herring and made 300 pounds of sauerkraut. <laughs> Yay! Yay! We never shy away. 75% of the people of this country want universal health care and expect it. And damn it, let's go. Concentrated, deep, slow, loving, tender, passionate sex. Whether you want to be on the cusp of current events or feast on pop culture. I should have a great time writing. I should write a book that is as fun as any party I'd be skipping. Inform events are fun and action-packed. I have a sh an anthropology scarf that does that <laughs> twisty thing, so. Come feed your mind and soul and celebrate the future with Inform. I love San Francisco, and every time I come back here, I remember that this is the only city in America that has magic. Hi everyone, I'm Crystal Contreras and I'm the director of Inform at the Commonwealth Club. Thank you for joining us today for our virtual program with feminist writer and founder of the award-winning blog, Miss Afropolitan, Mina Salami. She will be interviewed by Cinnamon Girl Inc. mentor, Lena Jennings. This conversation is a part of the Commonwealth Club's new focus on civics education and is in partnership with Cinnamon Girl Inc., an organization that empowers girls to be the visionaries our world needs. If you'd like to ask either of our speakers a question during this program, you can do it in either the comment or chat section of this live stream. The Commonwealth Club has temporarily suspended in-person events, but to keep the public informed during this outbreak, we are going full speed ahead with the full slate of live online programs. These programs are currently free to the public, so we ask that you please consider making a donation to help us continue our work. You can visit commonwealthclub.org online to learn more, and you can also text the word donate to 415 329-4231 during this program. Now, please join me in welcoming Mina Salami and Lena Jennings to Inforum. Thank you so much, Crystal. Hello and welcome to today's virtual program with Inforum at the Commonwealth Club. My name is Lena Jennings and I'm an equity strategist at Google as well as a Cinnamon Girl Inc. mentor. I am pleased to be in conversation with feminist writer Mina Salami, and Mina is a founder of the award-winning blog, Miss Afropolitan, and the author of a new book, Sensuous Knowledge. 
So we asked students from around the country to submit video questions for Mina today, and we'll get to a few of those at the end of the program. And so if you'd like to ask us a question, um, add them to the chat or in the comment section, and we will definitely try to get to them if we have time. So without further ado, let's get started. Thank you so much for joining us today, Mina. Thank you so much, Lena, and thank you to Cinnamon Girl and to Commonwealth Club for, for having me. I'm really pleased to be here. Yes, we are happy to have you. So let's dive right on in. Um, we have some exciting content to talk about, and we have lots of good questions from students around the country that we want to make sure we get to. And so just to start off, we know that you are proficient in five languages. You have lived in Nigeria, Sweden, Spain, New York, and you're currently in London. And so my question for you is, how has this global perspective influenced your writing and view on feminism? Uh, very much, but not, not intentionally, you could say. Um, very, it, it has influenced my feminism in a great, to a great extent and in different ways. So growing up in Nigeria, um, I was witness to a particular type of society and a particular type of patriarchy that was very much enmeshed with um, colonialism because Nigeria had been colonized for a century by the British um, and so there was this mix of what we could say uh, indigenous patriarchy with the kind of colonizer patriarchy um, and then I moved to, to Sweden and later to, to New York and I'm now in London and having lived in Spain and in each country um, I think what is really interesting is that uh, the way that the patriarchal education works is, is slightly different, but also it's fascinating and troubling um, that in each country that there is this, this education and that women in all parts of the world are being um, educated and indoctrined to see themselves as of lesser value than men. Um, but I think seeing how this plays out in so many different parts of the world and even in, in, in Sweden, which um, is one of the most egalitarian countries in the world when it comes to gender, um, although perhaps not when it comes to race or definitely not when it comes to race, unfortunately. Um, but even in that, even in Sweden, um, there were still so many obstacles that women were were fighting against. Um, so yeah, it it is it informs my feminism very much in the sense that I am starkly aware of the need for feminism because I have seen that this problem exists everywhere. Yeah, and kind of based off of your experiences in these five different countries that you have lived in, what would you say has been like the through line of the biggest need or the biggest kind of indoctrination that you've seen? in these drastically different countries, but with the same problem. Definitely that women are uh, robbed of our power. Um, so in each of these societies and everywhere in the world, uh, women are being indoctrinated into a male way of thinking and we're being told that we cannot do certain things. Um, so we don't feel that we have the power to um, shape our lives the way that we might want to shape them or to enter politics or to shape society or to take particular roles within the family and household. Mm -hmm. um, everywhere we are being robbed of, of power um, in ways that are so subtle that we sometimes don't even notice it. Yeah. And of course, the thing about power is that it is also the source of something that is equally fundamental in life, which is which is joy. Um, and if you don't feel empowered to make decisions that are rooted in, in your own preferences and to witness and live in a society that thinks, that shapes itself around your needs as much as it does around the needs of the other half of the population, mm -hmm. then it's very difficult to pursue um, joy or power for that matter because you you feel as though you're um constantly in a, in a state of kind of double consciousness yeah. um yeah. yeah so that's interesting so i'm gonna kind of skip around since you're start on a light note <laughs> let's start on a light note so you, <laughs> you brought up the topic of joy and i think joy is one of the things where despite all of the things that we as women especially women of color go through it is so easy for us to not possess joy. It's so easy for us to be upset about our 
inequities and upset about the things that bring us 10 steps back and upset about all of these other external factors that are outside of our control. But what is so powerful about joy and possessing it and kind of living our lives on our own terms and daring greatly enough to possess the joy possess the joy to really just go against the grain. And that's this political act of resistance is to possess that joy. Yeah. Um, so what joy means, and when I talk about joy in sensuous knowledge in my book, um, I'm referring to it as something that is political and, um, and quite intentional. So it's a kind of joy, as I, I say in the book, that it, sensuous knowledge is kind of the baby if you had married joy and rage together. Um, so this is a kind of joy that comes from having seen uh, that you live in an, in an ugly society, which is trying to diminish your value, whether it is because you're a female or because you're a person of color um, or you're from a different class, whatever it might be, um, you have, identified that something, the system at large is trying to diminish your value. And so you become intentional about this joy. Mm -hmm. um, and in a sense, in that sense, it is quite different from the related term happiness, which, um, which is a lovely feeling, but that is something that, that is far less intentional. So you can just feel that when you're, when you're doing something you love, dancing, etc. cetera. Mm -hmm. um, but with this kind of intentional joy, um, what you then begin to see is that in a patriarchal uh, Eurocentric white supremacist society, um, what happens is that women and people of color are not really able to, to embody the full range of human emotion. Mm -hmm. So for example, um, just such a thing as uh, aggressiveness even, which is not necessarily a positive emotion, but girls are taught from such an early age that they, they are not allowed to feel that, that that is something that is manly. But of course, every human being feels angry and aggressive at times. Mm -hmm. And so basically this multiplied with so many different emotions. And what then happens is that you're, you're starting to subdue yourself. You're starting to block yourself from behaving in certain ways. And that of course becomes an obstacle to joy. Mm -hmm. I love that you kind of brought up these different spectrum of emotions. And one of them is there's so many ways that we put these positive and negative connotations on emotions that are just emotions. They're neutral feelings, but feeling angry is bad. Feeling assertive is a bad emotion. Feeling rage is a bad emotion. But all of these things kind of coupled with being a woman, it's like, no, 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 don't do, don't be these things. Like be a good girl, be nice, be sweet, be kind, be considerate. But then the messages that men are getting are kind of go after the things that you want, like tackle the world head on, go forth, set the world on fire, do whatever it is that you want. But women always have to be kind, polite, considerate, generous. And so what's so mad about that is that we're simultaneously living in a world where women have so much reason to be mad about things, right? Um, but, but we have this huge uh, sense of obstacle in, in expressing our anger. It's, it's really a big problem. Yes, no, it totally And so therefore there, is, there can be uh, a joy to connect the two emotions. If, if you have felt for your entire life that you have to be a good girl and you have to be nice and polite and you can't express your anger in whichever way you express anger because that's also something that's very individual. Mm -hmm. But then if you become intentional about your joy, um, expressing anger can become something that actually makes you feel joy because it's, mm -hmm. it's you know, it can be a unique experience. A relief, yeah. yeah. I love that. So I want to get into the book. Um, there's so much good content in the book, and I want to make sure that we kind of talk about all that you have kind of in your book. So sensuous knowledge, it speaks about the intellectual brain as well as the emotional and intuitive brain. And so can you break down those different parts of the brain? And then what does it mean to chat? Like, what does that mean in terms of knowledge is how we, how we think about it today? Great question. Um, so yeah, the way the, the book works is that I, um, I first developed this concept that I refer to as sensuous knowledge. And I then apply sensuous knowledge to a range of different topics from beauty to power to womanhood, etc. cetera. And um, in brief, sensuous knowledge is a, it's a, it's a combining, a synthesizing of, uh, as you said, 
intelligence of the brain, like of 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 rational thinking and logic, um, with emotional intelligence, and the way that I figure uh, one must do that, because I think it's important that we do that, because what the the systems, the oppressive systems that we've briefly spoken about, such as patriarchy and white supremacy, what they do is that they create these fragmentations in our mind. So we think that we have to be either rational or emotional, or that, but that is not how human beings are. You know, we are uh, holistic beings. And so I found that it is important for us to integrate these two ways of knowing. And the way that I uh, think we do that is by mixing and interweaving things like science and technology, but also with arts and mythology and poetry and music um, and the natural world, seeking to, to find knowledge from, from trees and you know, rivers, etc. cetera. Um, and so, yeah, so I, I, I developed this concept and then I uh, apply it on these, these different topics. Yeah, and how does that challenge our limited knowledge of knowledge? How does that challenge our limited like, viewpoint of how we view knowledge kind of traditionally today? Well, what it does is that it, um, because another thing that is really, or three things that are very central to sensuous knowledge is that it is um, a woman-centered paradigm and it is Africa-centered and it is firmly rooted in black feminist theory. Mm -hmm. um, and this is important then because when you, uh, then look at a concept like beauty, for instance, mm -hmm. um, with this prism of sensuous knowledge that is embodying all of these ideas that I've just spoken about and that is woman-centered and Africa-centered, etc. cetera. Um, if you, as a person of African heritage, as a woman of African heritage, uh, look at it with yourself at the center, beauty suddenly means and can be something very different to what, what I call Europatriarchal knowledge, which is what I contrast to sensuous knowledge, what it tells us about beauty. Um, and this applies to pretty much every single universal concept. We have been looking at concepts through the eyes, through, through male and white eyes, so to speak. And it's not that those eyes have only produced bad things or ugly things. I want to be clear about that. Like there's a lot of very valuable knowledge in the world that was created by men and white people and so on and so forth. Right? But there's something about having to send, put yourself at the center in knowledge production that is really political and transformative. Mm -hmm. And I think it's also a big part of that is telling our own stories and uh, having us be our own historians as opposed to having the other or the opposing side or the differing side kind of tell our stories for us or tell the story for the entire world when they, again, come from their limited knowledge and experience, but we have a completely different set of experience just based off of our cultural differences, based off of our spatial differences and how we've grown up and how we were upraised in our upbringing. Absolutely. And, and this isn't coincidental because we quite often can feel that, oh, we have to become our own historians um, and become challenged in becoming our own historians because it isn't simple. And that has to be constantly articulated that becoming our own historians is an act of resistance because mm -hmm. we are living in societies where our, our governments, our popular culture, our families um, very often are not wanting us to be our own historians. And once you get that, again, going back to this thing about like having a kind of moment of confrontation, then you, then, then you can confront that system more easily because you, you see that it's, this is not supposed to be an easy task. Like I can't just tell my story because somebody is gonna have an issue with it. Um, and that kind of uh, motivates you a little bit more if, if you want freedom, right? Definitely, no, telling your story is definitely a route to freedom and a means to freedom. And not just kind of, if, I think it's your own personal freedom where if you kind of get the courage and you dare greatly enough to own your story, to own your voice and to use your voice for good and to counteract kind of the larger topic and the larger narratives of this world, it's one of those things where it's terrifying, but it's incredibly liberating to do so, to own your story, to broadcast it and use your experiences and your problem as this platform. 
Exactly. It's very liberating on a, on a personal level, just as you say. And then it is also very liberatory as um, Bill Hooks, the feminist theorist whom I cite a lot in my book, um, she might use that word, she uses that concept liberatory um, for uh, all of us at large. And by us, I mean, those of us who have been silenced, mm -hmm. whose voices have been suppressed. Mm -hmm. um, because when we, uh, when we speak our truth and tell our own story, we are gifting uh, each other, right? Because then you, if I do that, then you feel like, oh, I can do that too and vice versa, right? Mm -hmm. so it's, mm -hmm. a, it's, a, it's a reciprocal act of resistance, you could say. Yeah, it is one of those where we feed off one another to empower someone else to do it. So in that same vein um, about freedom and liberation, you write in your book, you can hang decorations in the master's home. You can spray slogans about freedom on its walls. You can create altars of equality in its gardens, but the master's house will still be a prison for everyone but the master himself. Can you expand on this a little bit and talk about the price that we all pay for living in the master's house? And what is the modern day master's house that we live in today? Right. Um, so that part of the book was uh, discussing uh, a very famous quote by the black feminist author, Audre Lorde, and she says that the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. And um, for a very long time, we, uh, and by we, I mean people, uh, feminists, but also anybody who is in the, the kind of wanting to end oppression of any sort, mm -hmm. um, have been focusing on what are the master's tools that will not, um, break down the master's house. Um, but uh, what I'm suggesting in that section is that if we turn our attention to the master's house, then we, the tools, they don't become redundant, but it's actually more important to realize that um, the master's house is not a place that we want to be and we don't want to see it at the table at the master's house. Um, because as in the in the past, as in, I said, said in the passage you read, um, it is always going to be a place that favors the master. Mm -hmm. um, and so what is that? Um, what is the master's house? It's, it's obviously many things and it's, it's things that are uh, associated with power. Um, so the master's house can be, you know, if you are in a, in a household where you have a dominant sort of male head of the family, mm -hmm. that's an example of the master's house. Um, and then of course, like our, our governments, our militaries, things like that. But what my book is really trying to, to aim at and to pinpoint most specifically is that the master's house is the knowledge production itself. So um, the kind of, the knowledge that we have about things like beauty that I mentioned earlier or power or womanhood, these are ideas that have been formulated by the metaphorical master's house. Um, and so until we counter that knowledge production itself, um, then even as we are resisting and doing activist work, we kind of end up going back to the master's house. Mm. Um, so so the, one of the very big motivations for me in writing the book was that I realized in so many spaces that I inhabit within like the black liberationist movement, feminism and so on, that we were so often um, like doing really important work, but somehow stuck creating the same kind of hierarchies or formulaic thinking. And I realized that this is because the very paradigm of knowledge um, and ideas with which we do this work. So for instance, if you think about power, how is power defined? You know, power is defined by large in, in ways that fit a patriarchal white supremacist society it is defined as something that is authoritarian and dominant and violent. And so if we within a movement are trying to reshape power, but we don't actually have we haven't redefined power itself. We just mm -hmm. kind of end up reproducing mm -hmm. the same problems. Um, so, so the master's house is ultimately the master's way of knowing and thinking. And so to break free of the master's house, 
some recommendations that I want to that I want to clarify and I want to make sure that I'm catching are is it coming up with our own definitions of our systems are the way in which we do and go about things or is it bringing awareness to kind of what is and connecting the divide between what is and where we want it to be what like what are the some of the first steps to, of that breaking free from the master's house and our minds and our environment but I think it might just be easier of just like in our own day-to-day lives like how can we ourselves break free from the master's house and way of thinking I really love that question because you've you've answered it almost because it is that um, fact that if you once you have awareness Mm -hmm. of how something is how ugly something is how it is suppressing you etc then you kind of it's like an innate automatic reaction to want to reimagine it Um, so the two go hand in hand and you can't separate them but I, I would say that awareness probably comes first and because then it's just so automatic that you start reimagining, recreating new language. I mean, the whole feminist movement and the civil rights movement and Pan-Africanism, these are actual, this is exactly what happened. People became aware of a particular type of injustice Mm -hmm. and automatically started to form movements along wanting something different. Um, But in terms of like in our our daily lives and how we can, um, how how we might come to that, those kinds of places of awareness where something changes in how we, how we know. Um, I guess the way that sensuous knowledge, um, the concept and the book contributes to that is by whatever it is that we are experiencing life, you know, whether it's uh, like what's going on now with, with COVID or something in our personal lives or the kind of work that we're doing, um, what sensuous knowledge is about is really uh bringing all of those different facets and parts of life that i mentioned earlier so if we looked at um a a situation in our in our work um relationships and then we looked at it not only with our rational brains but also with our emotional intelligence Mm -hmm. um when we're when we're facing a challenge challenge of some sort it is kind of bringing this holistic approach to solving it so looking at the the factual the scientific but also the poetic um the feminine the spiritual uh you know so really an um, embodied and holistic approach and so when we do that more consciously awareness again it's it can it can almost happen automatically because you're starting to look at a thing wholly rather than in that kind of fragmented Europatriarchal way right yeah definitely and you kind of hinted on it earlier and how I think of it is this element of exposure and how if we're exposed to different environments different things and different settings and ways of life we see how broken our own mindsets and how broken our own systems are. And I'm an avid travel and traveler, and there's this quote um, that says, we travel because distance and difference are the secret tonic to creativity. When we get home, home is still the same, but something in our minds has changed and that changes everything. And that's the same thing with this exposure to kind of patriarchy and the master's house. When we leave that environment, we see a whole new way of life, a whole new way of how things are created and done. And that doesn't change our home, that doesn't change our environment or our own master's house, but that changes our mind and how we view things and how we look at things. And then that is kind of a catalyst to get us thinking about how can we break the system? How can we break down these barriers? So I love that distinction. And in, with that, let's gonna, we're gonna roll on to some of our student questions. We have a few video submissions. And so let's just hear our first one. Hi, Mina, my name is Brianna Travis from Berkeley High School. I'm a cinnamon girl. And my question to you is, have you always been a good student in school? Also, did you struggle in school? And um, what messages were you told when you were younger to stay empowered and inspired? Thank you, lovely question um, to which I, have uh, like a twofold answer. I was both good at school and then I was a bit of a troublemaker <laughs> later in school. Um, and I think this had something to do with the different environments. I, so I, I did like my primary and part of my secondary school, as we call it, um, in Nigeria. Uh, I think that's middle school in the US. Um, and 
you know, there was, this was a really strict environment. So you had to be on your best behavior. Um, but it was also, uh, you know, we often think that that is the better way of schooling, but it was quite limiting in terms of, you know, you weren't really allowed to, to critically question uh, your teachers. Um, it was, it was really quite militant, you could say. Um, and then when I continued schooling in Sweden, which, you know, my first few weeks in my Swedish school, one of the, I remember one of my classmates throwing a chair at a teacher because he had upset him. And this was such a huge culture shock for me, but um, eventually it did, it did give me that gift of being able to question more. And perhaps I did that like even too much to the extent that I became a little bit troublesome, but um, yeah. Uh, and as uh, what was the second question in like empower, empowering messages? I mean, the, the, the very most important and fundamental one has, was always from my mother. Um, uh, my mom always has said to me that focus on your joy actually um, or happiness and make decisions whenever you have to make a difficult decision, uh, choose the one that will bring you closest to your joy. Um, and that is something that I, I am very grateful that she planted into me and that I always like to, to tell young women to, to bear in mind as well. Um, because especially in the world that we live in today, there are just so many different choices. Um, and simultaneously, the world is getting, uh, it's becoming uglier in many ways. It's becoming more corrupt divisions are growing. It's a harsh world for a young black woman to, to step into. Um, and so protecting your joy and your sense of self and, the, and knowing that the choices that you can make, because you always can make a choice, uh, that is something that nobody can ever take away from you. Even if they were to throw you into a prison cell, you still have the choice of whether you're going to sit in the left corner or the right corner, you can always make a choice. Um, and yeah, so that's something that I really uh, like to impart to young women that be aware on the one hand that the world can be really challenging, um, but on the other hand, there's a great uh, source of joy and beauty in knowing that you are the only person who can decide for you what you're gonna do and how you're gonna behave and who you're gonna become. I love that. Choose joy always. We have a few more questions. Let's get the next one going. Hi, Mina. As a young person, we, heard, we hear how knowledge is power of all the time. Can you talk about the history of this phrase and its true intentions and its purpose? That's an interesting question because there is a really interesting story behind this phrase, knowledge is power, which is a, you know, it's an empowering phrase. It's one that uh, the civil rights activists especially used. Mm -hmm. And so we use that term in black and African heritage communities uh, all around the world. Um, and we should, because knowledge is power. Um, but it is important to think about, again, um, what knowledge, all knowledge is not power. There is, um, as I say in the book, Europatriarchal knowledge, um, can be very disempowering. Um, and so it is therefore quite interesting that that phrase, knowledge is power, was actually coined by uh, one of the most like key Europatriarchal thinkers, Francis Bacon. Um, and he meant it not in the way that we do when we say it, he meant it literally. So he meant that if we know about um, like, women, this is this is something I'm making up. Bacon might not have used this particular example, but if we know that women have secret societies, then we can use that against them to acquire power. Um, if we know that nature operates in a certain way, then we can um, dominate nature. Uh, if we know things about indigenous communities, then we can use that against them. So he meant that knowledge was literal, and again, he also meant power in that way that is uh, defined as dominance and violence and authority, which is not how I think we should define power. Um, so it's a, it's a very interesting phrase in that sense. Mm, that was a great question. Okay, so let's roll on to the next one. 
Hi, Mina. Um, my name is Ayana Sadith, and I am 18 years old. And my question is, if you could give a young girl two or three thoughts to live by, what would they be? So I've been going on a lot about joy. So you know that I'm going to say um, that you should keep that in mind and, and keep it in mind as something that is a political act, so to speak. Um, also, to be um, to be true to yourselves. Um, always try to understand what your own truth about something is. Try to discover for yourself. So don't just take other people's word for things that are important to you. If somebody says that this is how um, black people are, or this is what such and such music is about or anything. Um, even if somebody says, this is what Mina Salami's book, Sensuous Knowledge is about, you know, you don't know that until you discover for yourself. So have that approach in life with everything that, that you decide. Um, and thirdly, I'm gonna say um, that be, be light. Um, be lighthearted as much as you can. Um, and this goes back to what we were talking about and how the world is such a challenging place and becoming even more so. I mean, we're right now in this dreadful lockdown and we don't really know what the future looks like. Um, we have to protect our sort of core uh, human, human nature and human right to, to just keep a light mind um, and not become too burdened by, by problems that you haven't created. And that is not to say that, you know, be unaware or, or uninformed, but, um, but don't allow these things, all of the very difficult challenges, all of the negative messages about black people, about women, about this, that, and the other, um, don't allow those things to, to penetrate your hearts and your souls and your minds. Um, but keep them, let them bounce off you. That's what I mean by, by be light. My mom has always told me to protect my peace and like accept the things that you cannot control, but above all else, protect your peace. Brilliant. Let's roll to the next question. Hello, my name is Madison Harvey. I'm 16 years old. And when questioning sexism and racism, we are often told that we are militant, radical, angry or even sensitive. And I wanted to know what can we do about these microaggressions? Thank you. Yeah, um, I think that relates a little bit to what I was just saying. It's, um, you know, we have to, the, you see the thing about your patriarchal knowledge is that it, it, it's trying to make it seem as though we shouldn't be questioning these things, as though we live, like as though it's normal to have our voices silenced and to face so many structural oppressions. We see, you know, larger amounts of, of black people dying at the moment because of COVID. There's all kinds of injustices as we, as we are all too aware of because they're evident. And yet um, it is, you know, it is a culture which makes us feel as though we're being militant and angry, like this angry black woman trope whenever we talk about it. So um, one thing that I think is really important and that I hope that I um, am able to convey myself when I speak is that, um, that these are issues that are actually very logical and rational um, and again, like embedded in emotional intelligence. And when you speak to people about racism or sexism or classism, um, adopt a tone of like it being evident uh, and then you sort of don't even get that angry necessarily because you're you're just sticking to the facts this is not it, it's not a question that is up for debate right like there is racism there is sex these are real problems and we are going to speak about them until they no longer are real problems. Um, and, and, you know, it's just a, a very sort of level-headed approach that I think works the best with these conversations, which um, I also just want to add that uh, if you feel angry about something, then express that. It's, it's completely allowed and okay. And, you know, if I have one message is that nobody should tell you that you are not allowed to express the whole range of emotions that you feel. Um, so go ahead and talk about the things that you care about um, in whatever way you feel is the best way. 
That's it. And they're no good or bad emotions. They're just emotions and they're, they're yeah. your experiences. Yes. So we have one more student video question. Hi, my name is Jayla. I'm class of 2022 at USC. And I was just wondering, so in your book, you referenced Lauren Hill a couple of times and you guys both talk about the importance of refraining from submitting your will. And so I was just wondering if you could speak more on that and just explain kind of why it's so important for young girls in particular to avoid doing this. Thank you. I love that question. Submitting your will, yeah. Um, I, I think it's, you know, it's already there in the statement. Um, it, it feels like a, a kind of, if we can invent a term, microviolence, uh, because microaggression means something different. Yeah. But you know, to because will is such a, it's such a powerful word. You know, it's it's like the thing that makes you alive. Um, you know, it's what gets you out of bed in the morning. It's it's your will to, to get up and go about with your day, whatever you have planned. And so when you put the word submit in front of it, it's a microviolent. You can instantly see how wrong that is. Um, that, that doesn't mean that, you know, sometimes you have to, you have to negotiate your will like we can't do everything that we want there are always going to be challenges for everyone in this world um but yeah um so when you if you can see that the the words don't fit together nicely and that there's a micro violence then you will start to see that a little bit more maybe whenever such an action is about to happen and then you can step out of it so if you're in a situation where um, you have said, oh, I'd like to do X, Y, Z. And somebody says, no, you're not allowed to do that because X, Y, Z. And you go, if you're about to go, well, okay. You can recognize that as I am submitting my will. And then it's like, no, I'm not going to do that. And you can sort of take a step back a little bit. I know these are like difficult things and we don't, uh, you know, nobody always has that awareness, but I guess what I want to say is think about the the words, you know, be be curious about these things and think about changing, reimagining how these things can work in your mind because then the action follows more easily. And that kind of goes back to what you said earlier about using having your own definitions of these things and finding out that knowledge for yourself and kind of stating your own fact as a fact as opposed to just accepting it from someone else. And my mom has always told me that a no does not always mean no, except when it comes to what she says. <laughs> All moms know, <laughs> always knows. <laughs> right? Yeah. So it is an informed tradition to ask all of our speakers the following question. So Nina, what is your 60 second idea to change the world? My 60 second idea to change the world is to encourage more curiosity in people. Um, so be more curious, be more curious about others, why they are the way they are, who they are, etc. Be more curious about the natural world, about animals, about trees and seas, etc. And also be more curious about yourself. Um, why you make the choices that you make, who has, you know, what has influenced the choices that you make. Um, and the reason this is my 60 second idea is because curiosity breeds awareness. And the more aware we become, the more present we become. And the more present we become, that's the only way that we can change the present. Mm -hmm. I love that. Being present is the only way we can change the present. So important. So Mina, can you just tell all of our viewers where we can buy your book and how to best follow your work? Of course. Um, so I have got a blog. It's MsAfropolitan.com. Um, and my social media handles are all at Ms. Afropolitan on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And I have hyperlinks there for sensuous knowledge, but you can also just Google sensuous knowledge and you'll get links for where to buy it.
Okay, well, you heard it here first, ladies and gentlemen, at Miss Afropolitan, and you can get linked out to all of her books and follow her content on social media. So thank you to Mina Salami for joining us today at Inform and the Commonwealth Club. If you'd like to watch more virtual programs or support the, the Commonwealth Club efforts in making virtual programming, please visit commonwealthclub.org slash give. And I'm Lena Jennings. Thank you, thank you, thank you, and stay safe, everyone. Thank you.